Hey Biology 400 students, this is Mr. Gales and today I'm going to be talking to you about the chemistry of life. We know the chemistry of life as organic chemistry. It's a special branch of chemistry that we're going to turn our attention to now in class. On the screen you see probably the most iconic or most recognizable of all the organic molecules associated with life. This is the DNA molecule. All living things use the DNA molecule to store their genetic blueprint. We're going to learn a lot about the DNA molecule in our coming unit and also later in the year. Let me remind you as we're getting ready to begin this screencast that you should have your uh, organic chemistry packet available so that you can take notes in your packet. Your notes should be done in the two column note format that we've used in class before. Main ideas go on the left hand side. Main ideas are always underlined. They're usually at the top of the slide. On the right hand side of your notes you're going to put uh, key ideas, definitions, examples. Uh, you can make drawings of any of the uh, important molecules that you're seeing on the screen and then also it's a good idea for you to write down questions that you have after we watch this uh, screencast. So as you're working through this, if you have questions on something you're not understanding, please make sure you record those in your notes. You will get to use those notes on the screencast quick quizzes that we do in class following the screencast. All right, so let's get started. What are we going to look at in this presentation? This presentation is going to focus on four major ideas. The first idea is the chemistry of life and just kind of understanding why it's important for us to understand the, the molecular organic chemistry in biology. We're going to look at what organic chemistry is. Uh, how is it different from the basic chemistry that we learned earlier in the year? We're going to focus on the carbon atom and its importance in building organic molecules. And then finally, the functional groups, the role of functional groups in adding diversity and functionality to basic organic backbones. All right, our first main idea is the chemistry of life. Now, you, when you look at this slide, you see a collection of organisms that see, seem vastly different from one another. Um, we can start by taking a look at an organism that we're already familiar with. We talked earlier in the year about the bombardier beetle. And the bombardier beetle is really special because it produces this burning caustic chemical in, it, in its abdomen, and it uses that chemical to protect itself from predators. Uh, another example of a really interesting organism is the puffer fish. We see the puffer fish down here. The puffer fish produces in its tissues a toxin which is widely believed to be probably the second most dangerous or lethal toxin in all of the vertebrate world. So we've got these two organisms that produce incredibly crazy chemicals in their bodies. We also have organisms that are, uh, you know, for instance, think about the, the eagle, a, a bird and a butterfly, an insect. Both of those are capable of flight, but yet they're very different in terms of their overall structure. We have uh, an organism here, a flower, an example of a plant that's able to do photosynthesis. And this, this is a protist, a single-celled organism that moves around on its own, but it can also do photosynthesis. So we've got a, a wide collection of organisms. How are they all similar? What do they have in common? Well, all organisms are made up of organic molecules. Those molecules that we find in their cells that build their cells and make all these diverse functions possible are referred to as organic molecules. So even though we are very different, all living things have their special qualities that make them different from each other, all living things share a common organic biochemistry. And that's what we focus on here in this presentation in, the, in this unit is that common organic biochemistry that ties all living things together. And again, that's just one further evidence from, for the fact that all living things have evolved over time from a common ancestor. Okay, the first main idea, the first big main idea that we're going to get into here is organic chemistry. What is organic chemistry? Today, organic chemistry is defined as the chemistry of the carbon atom and of the molecules that are built on carbon. Traditionally, organic chemistry was seen as the chemistry of life or, or the chemistry of molecules made by living things. So a quick rundown uh, between organic chemistry and what we might call or inorganic chemistry. In organic chemistry, we really focus on the six important elements for life, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Inorganic chemistry can not be limited to those six major elements. It really can include any, any and all elements uh, on the periodic table. With uh, in, uh, organic uh, molecules, carbon is the key element, and usually hydrogen and oxygen will be present. We start adding in some different elements. When we add in nitrogen, we find nitrogen in uh, proteins and also in the nucleic acids. 
We have phosphorus in the nucleic acids and also in adenosine triphosphate, which is an energy molecule our cells use. And then sulfur, sulfur is found in complex protein structure. Um, organic molecules tend to have a large number of atoms. The picture that you see at the bottom of the screen is an example of a relatively small organic molecule. This has 24 atoms in it. This is the glucose molecule. Its molecular formula is C6H12O6. So even though with 24 atoms that might seem quite large, when we compare that with something like DNA, which is made of billions of atoms, relatively small. But the general sense is that organic molecules tend to be large. And also, organic molecules tend to be associated with life. What we mean by that is they're generally molecules that are made by living things or directly related to the function of living things. Uh, inorganic chemicals are generally associated with the environment. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not important for living things. Sodium chloride, which is an ionic compound we learned about in our last unit, we know is composed of the cation sodium, which is just Na+. Uh, when sodium chloride dissolves in water or dissociates, it forms the sodium ions. And so when we have sodium ions in our cells, they play a very important role in the transmission of nerve impulses. Other important inorganic chemicals that are critical for life include uh, oxygen, molecular oxygen, O2, water, obviously, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2. Okay, carbon. Next main idea will be carbon. Carbon is the atom which is at the center of all organic molecules. So we need to understand why carbon is so important. And the importance of carbon really derives from its uh, chemical activity and based on the characteristic of carbon having a valence number of four. Carbon can form many bonds because of that valence number. So let's do a quick review of what that means. In our previous unit, we learned that the valence number is the essentially the bonding capacity of any atom. Carbon has a valence number of four. So what that means is carbon can make bonds with up to four other atoms. And those atoms can be other carbon atoms. They can be hydrogen atoms. They can be groups of atoms, which might include, for instance, oxygen, and you know another hydrogen that's going to be called a hydroxyl group you'll be learning about that uh, or any other group of atoms that might be involved uh, so with that valence number of four carbon is able to build very large diverse molecules okay that property of carbon the ability that to form four bonds because of its name uh, valence number of four is referred to as tetravalent so I'm going to write that in right here tetra from four and valent, referring to the valence number. So we say that carbon is a, an atom that is tetravalent, or its property of tetravalence is critical to its functioning. Okay, so why is the tetravalence so important? Well, when uh, molecules can form uh, many bonds like this, we say that they have the ability to store and release lots of energy. In a general sense, when atoms bond together, like when we see a bond here between the carbon and the oxygen or between a carbon and a hydrogen, those bonds represent stored potential energy. When the bond forms, energy is stored within that bond, and that's a form of potential energy. When those bonds are broken, whether it be between carbons and carbons or carbons and hydrogens or whatever it may be, when the bond is broken, that potential energy is released and oftentimes captured by the cell and able then used to, to do work. So carbon's ability to form many bonds allows it to store and release lots of energy. Also, carbon can build large and diverse different types of molecules. Those large molecules that we'll talk about in this unit are all going to be built on a carbon skeleton. We see here a basic kind of molecule called a hydrocarbon, which is carbon atoms bonded to hydrogen. This is a very generic, very plain molecule. It will be nonpolar because it's all carbon and hydrogen. Therefore, it's going to be hydrophobic and not interacting with water. Um, obviously, we know that living things are composed primarily of water, and so that's going to not going to be very functional. When we start adding on different groups to that hydrocarbon, then we derive the functions of the organic molecules we'll learn about. These molecules down at the bottom here that you see are called fatty acids, and they are the building blocks of lipids. A simple hydrocarbon with the addition of a carboxyl group on the end of it produces a fatty acid. Another example of an important organic molecule that cells use is a carbohydrate. This carbohydrate is glucose again. Uh, this is the molecule that our cells use to 
uh, provide energy. It's an energy source molecule. Our cells send that molecule through cellular respiration, breaking down the bonds, releasing some energy, which is captured in the molecule called ATP. All right, we also have up here nucleic acids. This is the DNA molecule, and down at the bottom, this is a protein. So we have a wide collection of molecules that are all built on carbon with the addition of the functional groups, and that produces the diversity of the molecules we see in living cells. Okay, the video we're going to take a short look at here is uh, all about carbon. So let's take a, a look at that, and then we'll come back and look at the next main idea, how we begin to develop diverse molecules. Go back to that. In the 17th and 18th centuries, when chemistry was in its infancy, researchers believed that there were fundamental differences between things that were living and inorganic materials. Living things, they felt, had some sort of vital life force. Today, we know that all matter, whether living or non-living, follows the same scientific principles but there are significant differences in the chemical makeup of organic and inorganic substances. Organic matter, to a chemist, is any material made up of substances that are living or were once living. The element carbon is the basis of all organic substances and sometimes organic chemistry is defined as the study of carbon compounds. Carbon has been called the element of life. It provides the foundation of the molecular structure of all living things, whether they are plants, animals, or microorganisms. Carbon's ability to combine with other elements results in a vast array of chemical structures. Of the estimated 12 million substances that have been identified, fully 80% of them have carbon as an important part of their molecular structure. Carbon-based substances range from simple sugars to complex proteins and DNA, and even diamonds. They include fibers in the clothes we wear, almost all of the food we eat, oil, gasoline, coal, plastics, wood, graphite, limestone, coral, and marble. All of these products are composed of organisms that were once alive, and all of them have carbon as an important part of their molecular structures. The secret of this unusual element lies in its atomic structure. Carbon has the atomic number of six, and is in the second row, or period, of the periodic table. It is an atom with six electrons in two energy levels. The outer shell, or valence level, has only four electrons. Elements in the second period, such as carbon, need eight electrons in order to fill the valence level. Carbon exactly fills half of its valence level with electrons. The octet rule says that atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons in order to acquire a full set of valence electrons. A carbon atom usually satisfies the octet rule by making four covalent bonds with other atoms. These bonds can be four single bonds, a double bond and two single bonds, or a triple bond with one single bond. Carbon is the only element that has the ability to bond in such a variety of combinations. Because carbon has only two energy levels, and consequently its valence electrons are relatively close to the nucleus, carbon is able to form short, strong, stable, covalent bonds. Due to these characteristics, carbon frequently links up with other carbon atoms, as well as other elements like hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen to produce long chains of atoms. Carbon atoms provide the framework for an enormous variety of different compounds that can participate in an amazing range of chemical reactions, and it is these compounds that provide the basis of life. All right, we see carbon is obviously very, very important, but carbon by itself forms very boring molecules. It's only with the addition of functional groups that we really develop these diverse molecules that have 
important uh, jobs that they perform in living things. So what are functional groups? Group, uh, functional groups are groups of atoms that can bond to the carbon skeleton. The carbon skeleton is the basic backbone uh, that builds all organic molecules. So I'm going to show you here what the uh, carbon skeleton might look like. We can have carbon skeletons which are just very basic straight chain carbons like this. So we have a straight chain backbone here. We also can have branched chain carbon backbones. Here you see the branching of the carbon atoms off of the main chain. We also see, typically uh, in organic molecules, this ring type structure here. And we'll also see where rings are bonded them to, to other rings to form double ring structures. Now those structures, again, by themselves don't have a whole lot of diversity to them in terms of the way they behave. But when we start adding uh, functional groups, we can see that that really is going to determine the properties of the organic molecules themselves. One thing that's very important to understand is once you know the functional groups, you are going to need uh, to understand that they behave consistently from one carbon base molecule to another. So when we add, for instance, a hydroxyl group to any of these particular carbon skeletons, that hydroxyl group is going to impart the same functionality. So the six major groups that we're going to le learn about and focus on in our class will be the hydroxyl group, the carbonyl group. The carbonyl group is broken down into two different types of carbonyls, the aldehydes and the ketones. The carboxyl group, the amino group, and the phosphate group. And you can see here the structural formula for each of these. A ball and stick model, which kind of gives you a better understanding of the orientation between the atoms, and then the kinds of uh, organic molecules that they would be found in. So now we're going to turn our attention to functional groups and kind of uh, begin to understand the, the different functions that they add to the organic molecules. And we'll begin with a, a short little video clip that talks about the effect of adding functional groups to um, our carbon backbone. Hydrocarbons are compounds containing only carbon and hydrogen, but a number of organic compounds contain carbon hydrogen, and other elements. These are called hydrocarbon derivatives. There are a staggering variety of these compounds, but fortunately, they can be grouped into classes based on their molecular structures. These classes are called functional groups. In halocarbons, one or more of the hydrogen atoms have been replaced by atoms from the halogen family, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. CHCl3 is structured like the methane molecule, but three of the hydrogen atoms have been replaced by three chlorine atoms. This is called trichloromethane. Its name follows the pattern seen before. Trichloro, three chlorine atoms. Meth, one carbon atom. And ane, single bonds. This compound was known as chloroform, a chemical widely used as a solvent and once used as an anesthetic. There are many halocarbons. Most have chains of carbon atoms bonded to hydrogen and other atoms from the halogen group. Just as halogen atoms can substitute hydrogen atoms, so can atoms from the hydroxyl group, which contains OH. These are alcohols. There are many different alcohols, and their chemical names all end in the suffix all. This is methanol, the simplest of the alcohol group. Again, the chemical name follows the pattern. Meth, only one carbon atom. An, signifies a single bond, and all, an alcohol. Methanol's other name is wood alcohol. It is a dangerous substance that can be lethal or cause blindness to those that drink it. There are many different types of alcohols. Beer and wine contain ethanol, the same type of alcohol that can be blended with gasoline to produce a clean burning fuel for cars. Ethers are another group. They are molecules which contain oxygen bonded to two carbon atoms. Ethers have various applications. They were once used as an anesthetic, and now are used to improve the performance of engines. When an oxygen atom is attached to a carbon atom by a double covalent bond, it is a carbonyl group. 
Aldehydes and ketones are in the carbonyl group and are used in the manufacture of plastics and adhesives. Two oxygen atoms can also bond to the same carbon atom, which creates groups called carboxylic acids and esters. And there are several classes of organic compounds produced when carbon combines with nitrogen. These classes are called amines and amides. Carbon can enter into a large number of other molecular arrangements to form a variety of common organic compounds. All right, so we see adding those functional groups really makes the carbon molecule or the carbon atom much more diverse. All right, we're going to run down quickly our six key functional groups. The first one is hydroxyl, so this is your main idea. We see a hydroxyl group, uh, which is going to be very similar, obviously, in its appearance to what we learned about in the, when we studied pH, the, the hydroxide ion. The hydroxyl group is OH, and so here circled in red we see the hydroxyl group. As you saw in the video, hydroxyl groups are, are found commonly in alcohols, but in terms of organic chemistry, we see them in carbohydrates quite a bit. So hydroxyl, key idea to find them in carbohydrates. Now, anytime you see oxygen bonded, we know that car oxygen bonded with either carbon or hydrogen is going to produce a polar covalent bond. So that we're going to say that the hydroxyl group imparts polarity to the carbon molecule that it's, it's added to, and that means that it's going to be hydrophilic. It's going to be able to interact and dissolve in water. Okay, the next major functional group is called a carbonyl group. Carbonyl groups can be divided into two subgroups. One of those subgroups is called an aldehyde. The aldehyde is a carbon double bonded to oxygen at the end of the carbon skeleton. Right? Uh, one way that a student in the past told me that they remembered this is that aldehyde starts with A and A is at the end of the alphabet or the beginning of the alphabet depending on your perspective. So at the beginning of the alphabet we can see that the uh, carbon double bonded to oxygen is at the beginning of the chain rather than within the middle of it. Uh, the aldehydes are going to be found in carbohydrates, particularly those that we call aldose sugars. And we'll see those when we begin studying carbohydrates very soon. All right, again, carbon bonded to oxygen produces polar covalent bonds. When you have carbon double bonded to oxygen, that's extremely polar. So this, again, produces a very hydrophilic type of molecule. Uh, another type of carbonyl is called a ketone. We also here are going to recognize carbo carbon double bonded to oxygen. The difference here is that in a ketone, it's on the inside of the carbon skeleton rather than at the end of it or at the beginning of it, as it were. So here you're seeing on the second carbon in the, in the chain, the carbon double bonded to oxygen. This is a ketone. This also is found in carbohydrates. We call these carbohydrates that contain ketones, we call them ketose sugars. Also, again, carbon double bonded to oxygen, very polar. So any ketone groups are going to impart hydrophilicity to the molecule, the ability for the molecule to dissolve in water. Okay, next functional group is called a carboxyl group. This is a very important functional group. This is carbon double bonded to oxygen and also to a hydroxyl group. So we're seeing here the carbon double bonded to oxygen like we had with the carbonyls and then the addition of a hydroxyl group. These are going to be present in lipids. They form the, what we call the polar head on a fatty acid molecule, and then also we find them in, in proteins. They're a major port, part of the construction of an amino acid. Very polar because of the oxygen. Uh, that means they're going to be very hydrophilic. And carboxyl groups have the ability to release hydrogen ions by dissociating the hydrogen from the hydroxyl end of it. When that happens, they are referred to as carboxylic acid which is, uh, plays an important role in biological functioning. Okay, our next functional group is called a phosphate. This one is extremely easy for you to identify because it's the only one that contains the phosphorus atom at its center right here. Uh, the, it's generally a phosphorus surrounded by oxygen. So if you thought about it, it's, it's going to have lots of oxygen attached to it. That means it's going to be extremely polar and extremely hydrophilic. We see phosphate groups in lipids. They're going to make up the polar head of the phospholipid, which is a component in building cell membranes. We also see phosphate groups in the nucleic acids. They build the backbone along with the sugar deoxyribose in the uh, nucleic acid molecules. 
and phosphate are also attached to a molecule called adenosine triphosphate that is the cellular energy source. Okay, so phosphate groups PO3, 2 minus, uh, very uh, polar, very hydrophilic. All right, and the final group that we're going to take a look at here in terms of functional groups is the amino group. The amino group is the group that contains uh, nitrogen and then two hydrogen atoms. We find amino groups in amino acids. They are the building blocks of proteins. They are one of the two major functional groups that we add on to uh, central carbon to make the amino acid. Uh, nitrogen behaves very similarly to oxygen in that when it's attached to either carbon or hydrogen, it is going to form polar covalent bonds. And because of that, we again have a hydrophilic type of molecule that forms. One other characteristic of amino groups is that they can act as bases by accepting a hydrogen ion to form an NH3. All right, that's the functional groups, the importance of the carbon atom, the overall look at what organic chemistry is and why it's important for us to study organic chemistry in a biology class. If you have any questions, be sure you've written them into your notes. We'll talk about those questions in class as we begin to work through our understanding of organic chemistry. And we'll start off with a quick quiz the first time you, uh, that we get together as a class after you've viewed this. All right, this is Mr. Gale signing off. We'll see you in class.